What is going on, my A-Push people? It's Mr. M. I'm here for uh, our last unit test review from 1960 to 1979. Um, and it's only 30 questions. There's a bunch of review questions. Uh, I will tell you, these question review questions are pretty quick, if you ask me. We'll be able to fly through most of them, I believe. So without further ado, let's get this baby underway. Um, so, one... Who won the election of 1960, and how did television play a role in that? Okay, John F. Kennedy is the winner. He defeats Richard Nixon in a very close election. Um, how did television play a role? It was the first time uh, that television played a major role, first off, uh, because it was the first time that televisions were widespread in all homes in the country. Uh, and remember, it played a major role in the debate. Uh, remember, the television, it was the first debate that was widely televised. Huge crowds watched it. Those who watched it on television tended to give the advantage to Kennedy, and it showed kind of the significance or importance of television, uh, that so many people saw him there, um, and uh, ultimately helped to propel him to the victory. Two, who was JFK's attorney general? How did the two of them support the Freedom Riders and Corps? JFK's attorney general was his brother, Robert RFK, Robert F. Kennedy. Um, they supported the Freedom Riders, remember, by uh, sending marshals uh, to ride the buses to protect the Freedom Riders uh, and Corps. Corps was the group that had arranged the Freedom Rides. Uh, please remember, they were reluctant civil rights advocates. They didn't want to get involved in civil rights, but remember... Um, ultimately, JFK felt that he had to because the situation was spiraling out of control. Speaking of that three, how did sit-ins, the Montgomery Bus Boycott, the 24th Amendment, and marches help the civil rights cause? Okay. Sit-ins, especially the one at Greensboro, North Carolina, um, challenged segregation in public places, right, and drew the media, uh, the cameras, uh, to the events and showed the rest of the country um, some of the discrimination that African Americans were facing. The Montgomery bus boycott also challenged segregation, this one on city buses. Remember, this is the Rosa Parks boycott where she refuses to give up her seat. Ultimately, Martin Luther King arranges this famous boycott. It lasts over a year. It's successful. Eventually, the buses are desegregated, and it's really King and the Civil Rights Movement's first major victory. The 24th Amendment ended the poll tax, remember, which required people to pay to vote. It was targeting African Americans almost exclusively. And marches to help civil rights, how did they help? Well, again, uh, they drew attention to the cause, especially since a lot of these marches oftentimes resulted in whites inflicting violence against the marchers, which oftentimes led to public awareness or and support for the marchers, uh, amongst people in the rest of the country. So all of these contribute to the growing progress of African American civil rights in the United States throughout the 50, uh, throughout the 60s uh, and into the 70s. Four, what was the president's response when James Meredith was denied access to the University of Mississippi? Remember, what does he do? He orders the National Guard to be placed under his control. And remember, they escort um, Meredith into the school um, and uh, ultimately, he uses essentially federal troops to guarantee that the university opened itself up to Meredith, the African-American. Five, what was the March on Washington? What was its objective? The March on Washington was organized by Martin Luther King. It was designed, if you remember, um, to uh, try to get the Civil Rights Act that Kennedy had proposed passed. Uh, it was where King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Um, and again... Uh, was to put pressure on Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act that was languishing in Congress. Ultimately, um, Kennedy was unable to get it passed, but Johnson does after Kennedy's death. What was the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and what did they do? Uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was a African-American civil rights organization made up of African-American religious leaders like ministers. It was organized and led by Martin Luther King and other religious leaders like himself. Um, anyways, it was a leading civil rights organization, and obviously because of the power of black churches in organizing the black community, it was an especially strong civil rights organization. Seven, what happened to JFK in 1963 and who succeeded him? Well, we all know JFK was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald, 
who succeeded him as president, Lyndon Johnson, his vice president. Number eight, what was the Warren Commission? Who did they rule was responsible for the assassination? The Warren Commission uh, was a government investigation of the killing of JFK. It was a congressional investigation. It was run by Earl Warren, the chief justice. Uh, they investigated all the allegations were out there, and their official determination was uh, that JFK was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald and that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Uh, number nine, the Warren Court's most famous for making decisions that protected what two things. Okay, so the Supreme Court during this era, during the 60s and 70s, remember, named after their chief justice, Earl Warren, uh, the Warren Court uh, was very progressive and very reform-minded. Uh, and so they made a series of decisions that, one, protected civil rights, for instance, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, by ending segregation. And then the second type of decision that they made were rights that we call of the accused. People who were accused of a crime, uh, were the, this court said they had a number of rights that previously had not been spelled out. For instance, they have the right to an attorney, um, they, even if they can't afford one. Uh, they have the right to know their right, their, their Miranda rights. They have the right to be read their rights so that they know what they are. Um, so, for instance, they know they have the right to remain silent. These are all things that this court says, uh, not only civil rights, but the right to the accused are things we're going to focus on so the government cannot abuse or take advantage of people that have been accused of a crime. Um, anyways, number 10. Who was the first African-American Supreme Court justice? Which president appointed him? It was Thurgood Marshall. Uh, the president that appointed him was Lyndon Johnson. All right, so Thurgood Marshall, the famous attorney who had helped win Brown versus Board of Education. He was an attorney with the NAACP, um, and he ultimately becomes the first African-American Supreme Court justice. Describe the black separatists, black power, and black panthers, including goals and leaders. Um, okay, well, black separatist, we normally think of the Nation of Islam, led by Malcolm X and others. Uh, they were a group that advocated black separatism. They wanted to live separately um, in an area of the United States removed from white society. They thought government ought to give them that land to do so. Uh, ultimately, um, Malcolm X is assassinated. He is killed uh, by actually members of his own group. Um, in a sort of kind of a power struggle. Um, and uh, anyways, black separatism, very radical, uh, very considered what is extreme for its time. Black power, led by uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, was more of a black pride movement and uh, that blacks should t try to, uh, you know, shop at black businesses. Blacks should try to support one another. There should be racial pride. Uh, they should perhaps dress uh, with more, um, you know, emphasis on, on racial pride uh, and remembering some of their cultural roots. Um, and uh, again, it was uh, kind of a student organization that became more radicalized uh, and really was, you know, uh, blacks for blacks, um, even though obviously they still might live amongst whites. The Black Panther Party was a much more radical revolutionary group that advocated overthrow of the government and the protection of black communities from white police. Um, and uh, very radical, very extreme, considered very scary by many other Americans. Uh, eventually the government um, and, the, and the FBI kind of broke up parts of that organization as a criminal group, as a gang. Uh, number 12, what was the new frontier and what, what did they call on Americans to do? How successful was it as a domestic program? New Frontier was Kennedy's program for the country. Um, remember, it was about kind of sacrifice and what Americans could do for their country. How successful was it? Not very. Remember, Kennedy could not really get anything passed as president, or very little at least, uh, because of the uh, Republicans and conservative Democrats that worked against him in Congress. Speaking of that, number 13, what two groups worked against Kennedy? Republicans, who were obviously the, the rival party, and then conservative Democrats from the South usually who didn't support his civil rights ideas uh, and didn't support some of his other progressive policies. Um, and so they <coughs> there were enough of them in Congress to block most of his actions. What was the Peace Corps? How was success successful in helping to defeat communism? Okay. The Peace Corps was an organization established by Kennedy. Remember, it hired college graduates um, to go overseas and to live in less developed places. 
uh, in an effort to try to improve development in villages and in the rural areas uh, so that there's more wealth, there's more growth, and those people are more willing to embrace the benefits of democratic and capitalist society so they don't turn towards communism. It was one of our ways of fighting the Cold War without actually, you know, sending troops or shooting, shooting guns. 15. What was the Berlin Wall? Why was it built? It was a wall that separated West and East Berlin. It really just separated West Berlin from the entire rest of, Germ of Germany. Uh, why was it built? It was built to prevent East Berliners from fleeing to the West. What was the significance of its fall in 1989? It was kind of considered the unofficial end of the Cold War, the symbolic end of the Cold War, when that wall was torn down. 16. What was the Bay of Pigs? How did it embarrass the U.S. and lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis? Bay of Pigs was a failed invasion of Cuba, but led by the United States, organized by the United States. Um, it was Cuban exiles or refugees that tried to overthrow their government with U.S. government support. It was a major failure. Most of them were killed or captured. Um, and it led the United States uh, to have to, one, apologize, which embarrassed the U.S. for having to admit that they had been responsible for trying to overthrow another government. And two, it nearly, it led kind of to the Cuban Missile Crisis because afterwards, Castro and Khrushchev became closer. Uh, Khrushchev worried that the U.S. Was, wor was going to try to take out Cuba again, and so he placed missiles there. <coughs> 17, what was the Cuban Missile Crisis? How did it lead to the brink of nuclear war in the early 1960s? Well, Cuban Missile Crisis uh, was a standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, between Kennedy and Khrushchev, over missiles that were located in Cuba. Uh, if the Russians continued to send the missiles and arm the missiles, the U.S. would consider it an act of war. So there was a major standoff, and the world held its breath uh, to see whether these two nuclear powers uh, we're going to back down or contest one another. Eventually, Khrushchev ordered the Soviet ships to back down, uh, and the Cuban Missile Crisis died down. Up until then, it was hit or miss. It was hold your breath uh, to see whether both countries would send the world into a nuclear war. Uh, anyways, um, 18, the United States CIA organized the overthrow of which Middle Eastern government in the 50s? They organized the overthrow of the... Iranian government. It was a democratically elected government. They were nationalist, um, and they started to nationalize some of their companies, which put them under government control. Uh, we were worried that that was the first step towards communism. We overthrew that government. Uh, the guy's name was Mohammad Mossadegh, and then we had him replaced with a dude who was loyal to us named the Shah of Iran. That's going to come back to bite us in the late 70s. 19. Were the major goals of the who were the major leaders of the modern women's rights movement? Betty Friedan, she wrote the feminine mystique, the spark that started the movement. Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was considered kind of um, a civil right, a women's rights advocate after World War II, really more even maybe after her husband's death. What were the goals and what were some of the major gains for women in the sixties? Uh, well, I would advocate that you look at your sheet that I gave to you, but remember the goals. For women were, you know, more equality in the workplace, better wages. Um, they ultimately, some of their gains, remember, uh, they wanted better divorce laws, remember. Uh, they were hoping to get uh, legalized abortion. Some of their gains, uh, legalized abortion with the Roe versus Wade decision. Um, more women in universities, uh, more women in higher positions. Um, and uh, we do definitely start to see gains for women across the board. What is the leading women's organization in the U.S.? It is now the National Organization for Women, and it was established partly by Betty Friedan. 20, what was Roe v. Wade? Uh, that was the Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion uh, in the United States. Why did women's groups support it? Well, they supported it because they felt like women should have the choice, the freedom to make decisions that affected their own body uh, instead of the government uh, or... Uh, other individuals. Uh, 21. What are the leading organizations associated with Chicano, Mexican, American rights, and Native American rights? Okay, first Chicano, Mexican, American rights, uh, the UFW, the United Farm Workers, uh, that is led by Cesar Chavez and to a lesser extent Dolores Huerta. Uh, they fought for a better quality, a better treatment uh, of migrant farm workers. Uh, 
Um, they are a, uh, a major or leading organization, most definitely. Um, the La Raza United uh, or UNIDA is another famous Chicano Mexican American rights organization uh, fighting for Hispanic Latino rights. Native Americans, it's AIM, the American Indian Movement. It was kind of a militant Native American rights organization fighting for a better economic ac opportunity, uh, more awareness of their conditions on the reservation. Uh, remember, they had some serious fights with the U.S. government at Wounded Knee and other places during their protests. 22, what was the counterculture? New left, LD, SDS, and how did each represent discontent with 60s policies? Okay. Counterculture were the hippies, they were the flower children, they were the people that completely rejected traditional society standards and norms. They embraced, you know, um, free love, music, drugs, Eastern religions. Uh, they oftentimes lived on communes. Um, you know, it was kind of a free clothing optional sort of life, I guess you could say. Um, very different, very counterculturally, a lot of baggy clothing, you know, like uh, typical hippies. Um, new Left <coughs> SDS, they were college students. They were much more mainstream. They simply wanted to reject what they considered to be the political decisions that were being made by the government in regards to Vietnam. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted civil rights to happen faster. So that's all they were. They were not nearly as radicalized or extreme in terms of their rejection of society as the counterculture. Uh, but they both were upset with different parts of 60s policies and society. 23. Be sure you know each of the following. Civil Rights Act of 64. Remember, that's the one that ended, ended segregation in public places. Southern cities began to desegregate after this law was passed. The Voting Rights Act, remember, registered African Americans to vote and allowed the federal government to take over elections in places if needed. Uh, remember, 750,000 African Americans are already registered to vote just a few years later who had not been. The Immigration Act of 65, remember, another part of the Great Society, all of these are. Uh, this uh, eliminated the quotas uh, so that uh, there was no more preference for European immigrants anymore. Um, it basically established a first come, first served uh, basis and it led to the growth of Asian and Latin American immigration so that those are way majority of our immigrants today. The Medicare Act, remember, gave medical care and insurance to the elderly uh, because those groups obviously struggle to pay for those increasing costs. Um, and so the government, through taxpayer funding, would pay instead. Affirmative action, remember, is where positions and or places in schools were held for minorities and women. Eventually, uh, while it still goes on in some states, um, I should say while it still goes on, um, in some jobs, because the Supreme Court never ruled against that. It is no longer used, for instance, in uh, schools, uh, by schools. Um, they don't just use affirmative action anymore. 24, what was Dien Bien Phu and what European nation was embarrassed there? It was the major embarrassment of the French uh, in Vietnam. It was when they lost their remaining army. They had to surrender it. Uh, what occurred as a result? Uh, South Vietnam was divided into a North and a South. North was communist, South was non-communist. Why did the U.S. support South Vietnam? Well, because it was non-communist, because we helped to establish it as a rival to the communist government in the North. North. Who was who were Ho Chi Minh? He was the lead, communist leader of the North. Who was Ngo Dinh Diem? He was uh, the non-communist leader of the South that we supported. Which countries did they lead? I already mentioned. And which foreign power supported each? Well, the U.S. supported Ngo, um, and China, and to a lesser extent, the Soviets supported Ho Chi Minh. Uh, what was the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and how was it obtained? Remember, it was when Congress gave Johnson unlimited power to wage war in Vietnam. They said he could wage war, he could spend unlimited money or send unlimited troops without congressional approval. Uh, they basically gave him control to run the military without any sort of oversight. How was it obtained? Remember, he talked about the Gulf of Tonkin incident where American gunboats' ships had been attacked by North Vietnamese planes. Uh, in reality, he lied, remember, because we had provoked the fight. We had provoked the incident um, in order for them to fire on us. Describe the ground and air war in Vietnam. Who were the Viet Cong? Well... The ground war was brutal. It was difficult. It was seek and destroy missions, trying to find the enemy. It was constantly looking for the enemy. 
in very, very incredibly difficult jungle terrain. Uh, instead, there were oftentimes ambushes. Uh, there were uh, booby traps. There were um, soldiers constantly going out on search and patrol missions or search and destroy missions. You try to seek out the enemy to find them uh, and then to eliminate them. That often involved going into villages, searching the villages, looking for contraband, weapons, uh, or enemy signs of enemy activity. Uh, ultimately, it was a very, very difficult war to fight. It was hard for Americans to determine friend from foe. Uh, and it was difficult for them over time to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people because they were very much seen as kind of outsiders in a more local fight. Um, describe the air war. Well, the air war was just constant bombing of North Vietnam by the U.S. Um, and uh, that was Operation Rolling Thunder. It went on for, for years and years. Um, in an effort to try to get the North to surrender. Who were the Viet Cong? They were rebels. They were people that lived in the South, in the villages of the South, uh, who supported the communists or were communists and were actively trying to spread communism and to undermine the government of Go in the South. On 28, what was the Tet Offensive? Why was it significant? Tet Offensive was the major Viet Cong attack against... Uh, almost every major American and South Vietnamese position. Um, it occurred in 1968 during a ceasefire during the Tet holiday. Why was it significant? Because, remember, it was a turning point in terms of public opinion. American public opinion began to turn against the war, and if slowly Americans begin to demand uh, an end to it um, and believe that their government and their military leaders were lying to them. Because, remember, just before Tet, the military leaders had said the end is, is close. 29, what was Operation Rolling Thunder? How did it change public opinion? Operation Rolling Thunder was the three-year three massive bombing campaign of North Vietnam. How did it change public opinion in Vietnam and inside the U.S.? Um, it, I mean, it didn't really help us in terms of public opinion in Vietnam. We were kind of seen as these people that indiscriminately bombed these outsiders. Um, and so it often turned some villagers or some Vietnamese citizens slowly against the U.S. Uh, inside the United States, again, it didn't help with the anti-war movement um, because they were seen as, you know, they kind of made us seem like we were just these, these, these bombers, these guys that were there to just bomb people indiscriminately. Um, the public tended to support it because it meant less American lives lost. 30, what Vietnam policy generated the most public opposition inside the U.S.? That would be the draft. Um, how did some Americans, I mean, it's the draft. Don't forget about escalation with, with Johnson, but the draft is the big one. Uh, what Vietnam, uh, why did they hate it? How did some Americans protest it? Remember, they went to Canada, they burned their draft cards, uh, they refused to report. Um, and uh, why did it have the most opposition? Because you're forcing people to serve now in a war that was unpopular rather than taking an all-volunteer force. 31, what was the My Lai massacre? What was the end result? My Lai was when American troops massacred Vietnamese citizens in a village called My Lai because uh, they were frustrated and upset with being able to figure out who communist and friendly forces were and which side this village supported. So they took out their frustration on the villagers, men, women, and especially little kids. Uh, what was the end result? Uh, the lieutenant in charge was actually sent to uh, military jail for it, uh, but nobody else was punished for it, even though the soldiers involved said that they were following up or orders from above. 32. What events in Vietnam led to new waves of protest in the 70s, like the Kent State and Jackson State incidents? Uh, when President Nixon announced that he was expanding the war uh, by sending forces into Cambodia to take out communists there, um, the you know public outcry protests increased. Also, when the public found out that President Nixon had secretly been bombing Cambodia and Laos for years, um, the uh, protests increased after that as well. Thirty-three. What were the Pentagon Papers? In what case stopped Nixon's attempts to block them? The Pentagon Papers were papers that proved that Johnson had lied about the war um, and had lied about the Gulf of Tonkin incident and you know, provoked that incident. They were being read by a guy named Daniel Ellsberg in the Pentagon, and he leaked them to the newspaper, the New York Times. They tried to publish it. Nick, Nixon tried to stop them because he thought that it would make the government look bad, because it would. Um, ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled against Nixon in the case of 
uh, the United States versus the New York Times. Uh, ultimately, um, the newspapers did publish those stories, and it showed that Johnson had deceived the public. And uh, many people not only turned against Johnson, who was no longer president, but they just kind of lost faith in the government as a whole, felt like the government was kind of lying and being deceptive. Describe the Paris Peace Accords and the Secretary of State responsible. The Secretary of State is a guy named Henry Kissinger. Uh, he was Nixon's uh, Secretary of State, very famous. Describe the Paris Peace Accords. Um, it was simple. Remember, the war stopped temporarily. Um, everybody stopped where they were until the U.S. got all of their troops out. And then once the U.S.'s troops were out, the North and the South would go back to fighting each other again. The U.S. wanted their POWs, their prisoners of war. So basically, we turned tail and bailed. Um, and, uh, and basically said South Korea, or South Vietnam, you're on your own. Uh, what year did the United States' last American troops leave Vietnam? Uh, it was, I believe, like 73. Um, and uh, what president was in Viet the White House when South Vietnam surrendered? It was actually Gerald Ford. So in just two years, South Vietnam had already fully surrendered to the North. How was the War Powers Act specifically designed to prevent another repeat of the Vietnam quagmire? Remember, the War Powers Act said that from now on, a president could only take use, use troops, could only do what he wanted for 90 days. After that, he had to come to Congress to officially get a declaration of war or get authority from Congress or else troops overseas had to come home. Uh, it was there to prevent uh, the Vietnam situation where they had given unlimited power to Johnson and he had escalated the war by sending more and more troops to the conflict. Uh, what was the Southern strategy? It was Nixon's strategy to win the election of 68. He appealed to white Southerners and, uh, and Southern Democrats and Republicans who were upset with the instability, the protests, the riots that they were seeing on television. He promised order and stability. Uh, how did George Wallace affect the outcome? Uh, Wallace took votes away from the Democrats uh, because those, those people voted for him, the third party candidate. And so it allowed Nixon to, to win the election uh, fairly easily. Who were the candidates in 72? And how did a divided Democratic Party and Henry Kissinger help Nixon to win? Well, first off, the candidates in 72 were um, Nixon, again, running for re-election against uh, George McGovern, a candidate uh, on the uh, Democratic side. The Democrats are divided, um, again, uh, between uh, two different factions. Uh, and Henry Kissinger, Nixon's Secretary of State, had said that he thought that there would be an end to the war in Vietnam soon, right before the election. And that was an election that Nixon ended up winning. Uh, and so he got a little bit of a boost from that, and he propelled him to the 72 election. So the irony of that 72 election and number 38, was that Nixon cruised to the victory. Um, so all of the next few questions and all what he does after this is even more inexplicable. Uh, because number 39, what is Watergate's scandal and why was it significant? So Watergate was this massive scandal uh, where Nixon uh, was spying on uh, his, his people that he considered to be his enemies or his opponents. Uh, he was, uh, you know, or he was using the FBI and the IRS to harass his enemies. Uh, he was doing things that outside of what he was supposed to use these functions for. And remember, the big issue was he had this group uh, break into the Watergate Hotel to try to spy on his enemies in the Democratic Party to try to get information on them. Um, and ultimately, it's a scandal that's going to bring him down as president after he is caught lying about it. How did Nixon use the FBI and the IRS? Remember, they would investigate and launch like IRS audits of him, of, of people that he considered to be opponents. Uh, they would develop files on people so they could try to develop incriminating information against them if they ever needed to use it for political purposes. All of these you're not supposed to use the FBI and IRS for, for your political matters. 40, what was Creep and who were the White House plumbers? Creep was the committee to reelect the president. Uh, it was made up of a lot of his closest advisors. Um, they were taking money and they were secretly funneling it to these illegal activities. Uh, they were paying a group of kind of like ex-CIA spies and things like that, a group of guys known as the Plumbers, to go out and try to dig up dirt on some of their uh, of the rivals and the enemies and 
people that they needed thought they needed to keep an eye on, um, especially Nixon, because he had this huge, huge list of perceived enemies. Uh, all these people were out to get him, he thought. Uh, so they were paying these people money. These guys went and they tried to break into the Watergate Hotel to get information on members of the Democratic Party. Um, of course, they get caught, they get arrested. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, that would have been the end of it. Uh, but what happens is two reporters, number 41, who were Woodward and Bernstein, uh, they, uh, they are two reporters. They get a tip from an informant that tells them that they uh, need to investigate this because there's more to this scandal. Um, and uh, ultimately, it turns out that uh, they start to investigate and they get government officials to start investigating uh, who was responsible for the break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters. Uh, ultimately, remember, some of these plumbers um, start to say that individuals in Nixon's government, Nixon's White House, were involved. 42, what were the Watergate tapes? What term did Nixon use to explain why you shouldn't have to release them? Okay. Um, so it turns out after, you know, Nixon denied any involvement in ordering the break-in uh, and or covering it up, uh, it turns out that he has these tapes uh, that he's recording people with, including himself, um, and some of these tapes involve... Um, him talking about Watergate and potentially about covering up the crime uh, so that his role and their roles are hidden by it. Um, and uh, ultimately, the government wants these. Uh, the special prosecutor that's appointed wants them. He wants to um, he wants to know he wants to see these tapes and hear what's in them. Uh, remember, Nixon said he didn't have to hold hand him over because he had something called executive privilege, which said that the president, has special power and shouldn't have to hand things over in the interest of national security. Uh, of course, in the case U.S. versus Nixon, where the government sued its own president, uh, they ordered him he had to turn the tapes over. He did. It proved he knew about Watergate. It proved he lied under oath when he said he didn't. It proved he and took part in trying to cover it up. Um, anyways, he's forced to resign. Otherwise, he would have been impeached. Who replaces him? His vice president, Gerald Ford. Um... They actually, what's funny is Ford was a replacement vice president. Uh, the original vice president, Spiro Agnew, had to resign because of tax evasion. So talk about a crooked government. 44, what was detente and how did Nixon Kissinger implement it with China and the Soviet Union? Detente was an improvement in relations with the communist countries, with China and the Soviets. Uh, one of the ways we did it was we played each of the countries against each other. Uh, what were the goals of pursuing it? Well, we wanted to, improve, we wanted to avoid conflict, if at all possible. Um, and uh, what event prompted the end of detente? Uh, the Soviets kind of ended it when they invaded uh, Afghanistan in, in 1979. When they did that, we started to put more pressure on them again. We started to be more hardline again. Uh, but during detente, like, hey, Nixon visited China, remember? He visited uh, the Soviet Union. Um, their leaders came over here. Uh, we had a number of agreements that where we would make common sense deals to try to, you know, where we would give them food. We signed SALT-1, which was a major missile defense treaty where we agreed to reduce our missiles. Um, so, you know, strategic arm limitation, we're going to start reducing our arms. That's a major arms agreement we're going to sign. Um, number 45, what was the Philadelphia plan and why did Nixon initiate it? Uh, it was an affirmative action plan. Uh, and it was specifically geared towards women hiring and women's uh, entry into schools. Why did Nixon initiate it? Uh, well, to kind of take advantage um, of some of the movement for those things, but really because he thought it would weaken labor unions uh, if more people were in the workforce. 46, what was the cause of energy crises inside the U.S. in the early 70s and then again in 79? Remember, they were oil embargoes by... Middle Eastern oil countries known as OPEC. Uh, OPEC was responsible for the high prices in the U.S. because they reduced the supply. Why? They were angry about U.S. support for Israel and later uh, about our support for the Shah of Iran in 1979. 47. What were the major problems with the economy during Carter's presidency? What were the causes of that? Uh, stagflation. Um, was a major problem throughout the 70s where the stagnant economy but inflation occurred, um, high unemployment, uh, 
Um, again, a lack of trade, uh, high energy costs. Uh, it was a really tough time with the American economy in the 70s. The economy really struggled throughout most of the decade. Number 48, what was Jimmy Carter's greatest success as president? Uh, he was one of the few presidents to negotiate a peace in the Middle East, although it did not last a long time. He at least achieved that. What was his greatest weakness? The Iran hostage crisis. Uh, his support for the Shah of Iran uh, ultimately led to Iranian radicals seizing the U.S. Embassy and holding Americans hostage for 400 and something days. Uh, he could not get them freed. He ordered a military mission to do so that was a disaster for the U.S. Uh, ultimately, uh, Ronald Reagan was able to negotiate their release when he became president. All right, folks, that's going to do it. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, and if not, well, you only have 30 questions to worry about. Mr. Majewski, 48 review questions in 36 minutes. I told you it'd be fast. Hopefully you can hit the pause button.